Welcome back, 46 Dear Warners. This will be the first in a two-part series on sockets and network programming. A few logistics items before we get underway. This material is drawn out of Stephen Zarego, Chapter 16, so read along at home as you're so inclined. And our goals here are somewhat modest, is just to relate this idea of sockets to some of the things that we have seen previously in the course and importantly set up the motivation for them as this uh, facility that enables servers and clients uh, to exist. Uh, in terms of our upcoming schedule, we are very close to the end game. Uh, your project two, which is due Monday, uh, that's ongoing and ask questions uh, during either lecture time or uh, office hours as the need arises. And uh, Monday will also be our last lecture, uh, which we'll wrap up our discussion of sockets uh, in a second part. We'll probably also have an additional video that I put out subsequently that does a little bit of review and wrap up on the course. Uh, you'll have a lab that day uh, that surveys a few items associated with sockets. And I have a homework uh, It's brewing. It should go out later today for you. And it'll be released today, the 29th, and be due in a week, so after the project's actually done, which will explore that socket concept concept in just a little bit more detail. So we're only a few short weeks away from uh, the final exam. Uh, that's Monday, May 11th uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, do mark calendars so that you're aware of it. The other logistics item that I want to remind you of uh, is that the official university reminders or uh, evaluations, this uh, student rating of teaching, uh, that's SRT for short, uh, it's available, although online this semester as everything else is. If you click on the following link, I am told that you will be uh, taken to the spot where you can fill out course evaluations for all of the courses, including this one uh, that you are enrolled in. Uh, you'll want to make sure to tie your evaluation here to lecture. 001, that's the lecture associated with me. If you are so inclined, you can also evaluate the lab section that you attended and the TA associated with there. Those are due the last day of classes, uh, Monday, May 4th. We don't miss the deadline there. So then, let's move ahead with our discussion of network programming. As a quick overview, all of you are aware uh, that computers are not isolated anymore, uh, that your devices are constantly talking to each other across a variety of different wireless and wired types of connections. And the fact that computer programming uh, started in an era where there were no networks uh, speaks to the fact that a mere 50-ish years later, uh, we're now in this highly networked world, uh, how hard it can be to sort of keep track and keep up to date with uh, network stuff. Uh, there are a few things that are invariants, uh, and I think this is what we'll try to focus some of our attention on. Uh, that communication protocols usually need a good understanding of operating system concepts out of the box, and that if you are missing such things, uh, then it will probably lead to trouble later on. But they also require a good understanding of network protocols, as in for this style of communication, it's been decided that two programs that want to talk to each other need to go in the following order, that program one says this, then program two responds with this, and program one is then able to make some request of some type, which will be interpreted by program two. You're already becoming familiar with this notion of protocols as you would work on something like our last project, this Blather chat server, where the binary data that's exchanged between clients and server is something that constitutes a sort of protocol. And there's a clear set of semantics about who gets to go first and who uh, gets to go second. So that is in terms of understanding what kinds of protocols are present out there in the real world in actual network program is beyond the scope of our class right now. But we're essentially going to focus on a few of the uh, basic and useful utilities in the operating system and relate them to things that we've talked about already. This should enable you then uh, to go out and start doing a little bit of network programming and um, uh, potentially start to learn about those protocols either on your own time or through other classes. Uh, you're up against several challenges as you attempt to learn network programming. Uh, and that largely stems from the fact that uh, this advent to network programming, uh, as folks tried to get it right the first time, they missed the mark on a few things. So uh, network programming is advancing rapidly, both in terms of the physical technology that's used and then uh, the protocols and so forth that support it. So examples that you might see out there uh, on someone's arbitrary web page about network programming, they may or may not work depending on how old they are, or they may or not, uh, may not work based on the security assumptions that that they make. Now, we'll allude to those things uh, or cover them in some more detail in just a moment. 
So then, all of that to say, our goals are, are modest. Uh, that we're going to introduce this notion of a socket as this thing that allows Unix programs uh, to open up a connection to the outside world and find also that this socket is good for internal communication in some ways as well. And relate this to our previous experience uh, using various I.O. facilities. And it turns out one of the uh, brilliant decisions associated with sockets in Unix land is that they essentially are presented as a file descriptor. So all of your favorite friends like read and write and pull uh, and so forth, they work on on sockets just as well as they work on other things. Uh, so we'll touch on a few network specific details, but leave the rest to some courses that cover uh, networking in more detail. Uh, there's an undergrad uh, elective uh, CSI 4211 intro to network programming that is probably a good choice if you're interested in this stuff. I mentioned this uh, uh, in our sort of preface uh, that networks are this interesting thing that you have to physically construct. It's not a completely software construction. And oftentimes in software, we are insulated from this fact that as you program uh, against some interface, it's a standard interface, uh, Unix API with uh, system calls of various kinds, you don't care very much whether it's an AMD or uh, an Intel or a ARM processor that's backing this stuff like your insulated from a lot of that. Uh, unfortunately, there are times that this starts to rear its ugly head and you actually have to start worrying about it. Um, the Internet Protocol, or IP, has had several versions, and the major ones that are still in use are IPv4 and the newer IPv6. These two have some markedly different uh, cosmetics and underlying um, machinery involved in them. Things that are a bit beyond my scope to really explain very well. But one of the reasons that you would have another version of this internet program protocol to allow folks to, to talk to each other across these physical network connections is that the original version, IPv4, they picked certain bit widths, like addresses will be 32 bits uh, long. And this limits the number of devices that can have unique addresses and therefore be located. Um, to that end, uh, the change in IPv6, one of the immediate ones, is that addresses are bigger, uh, and this means more devices uh, can be uh, used. There's been a long history of different folks uh, stating like what limits need to be, uh, but invariably we seem to bump up against those limits and need to establish new standards on that front. Uh, back in the day that IPv4 was established, 32-bit uh, addresses seemed like a good idea, uh, and that uh, didn't really you know, matter too to much because there weren't that many computers connected to the internet. Well, now, uh, days when everything from your watch to your toaster to your refrigerator wants to connect, uh, the, there's a grow, strong need for more addresses. And the XKCD comic, I think here, uh, <laughs> they uh, are have an interesting take on this in which uh, they purport that um, if we inadvertently invent some large swarm of nanobots that starts devouring the earth, uh, each of these will probably communicate across the standard network protocol. And if they run out of addresses, uh, then uh, there's a limit to the number of nanobots that exist and grow. Um, so uh, take that one with a, a grain of salt. Uh, we're not close to nanobots as far as I know, but that no, no matter. Um, so with that in mind, then, uh, some of the old examples that worked in IPv4 uh, that you'd see out on the network, uh, they're essentially deprecated at this point, that if you're going to go ahead and write new code, you may as well use stuff that is appropriate for the newest version of the Internet Protocol. This will mean your code works as far as possible into the future. Uh, we'll see this in several spots, uh, that network programming is changing. It's full of historical relics in terms of uh, the, the stuff that you'd view out there. Um, uh, and uh, to that end, we'll try to focus our attention on stuff that works in the present era, knowing that if you look at these slides 10 years down the line, uh, probably a lot of what I was going to say is, is dated on that front. The other uh, immediate uh, limitation that you'd see in terms of network programming uh, is that as I was coming up, security was not a you know, major concern associated with network programming, but these days it very, very much is that almost every server that you would encounter uh, runs a piece of software or hardware in some cases uh, known as a firewall. Uh, the notion of a firewall is that it really does create a barrier between communication with this server through certain um, 
vehicles known as ports uh, that would prevent you from experimenting very well. Uh, that means that as you're on a server, like uh, your own personal machine, you can do pretty much whatever you want if you have administrator privileges. Uh, but chances are likely your program, your um, your personal computer is still running a firewall. Most OSs configure one out of the box. And particularly if you wanted to go to some public internet address, such as lab machines on campus, uh, then those are behind some layers of firewalls. And so attempting to set up, well, for instance, a little server on a lab machine uh, and connect to it via your personal computer from home, you'd probably encounter difficulties there because uh, you don't wouldn't have permission uh, to drop the firewall on the university side. And therefore the university firewall would prevent your um, home computer from contacting this little server on lab machines uh, that you're trying to set up. Now that doesn't mean that uh, all is lost, that instead we'll, we'll probably uh, make use of uh, the sort of standard, we'll set up a, a, a little network, like one that's essentially my computer talking to itself on that front. Uh, and to that end, uh, there's no place like home or for the um, sort of IPv4 uh, tech savvy, there's no place like 127.0.0.1. Uh, the standard IPv4 uh, format uh, is uh, to place numbers in a series uh, with dots in between them. And the values that are in those uh, slots, uh, they can be from 0 to 127. That's because they're essentially a single byte. Anybody who's doing counting, that means see, we'll see, oh, this is a four byte quantity, uh, that's 32 bits. This is the source of the 32 addresses in IPv4. Uh, and fortunately, uh, even this little uh, bit of business is a little bit weird uh, these days because uh, the new name for home in IPv6 is this atrocity, colon, colon, one. Uh, and we may or may not sort of uh, be able to get that kind of thing uh, to work out all right. Um, so a lot of the examples that we're going to work here essentially uh, are premised on you running uh, stuff on your own personal machine and having a server and a client on the same machine. Uh, but that shouldn't worry you too much as soon as you get privileges uh, to run stuff elsewhere, uh, then you could fire it up uh, on a public machine and be able to connect to it there. I'll see if I can arrange for our next and final meeting to have such a thing in place uh, so that we can actually uh, make use of uh, uh, sort of actual network communications. So let's talk a moment uh, about these sockets. This is an abstraction that's sort of like files. And it usually means that the operating system is going to set up a bunch of internal data structures that insulate you from the need to manage low level stuff associated with network communications. Generally, unlike a file, which is stored locally, or other sort of uh, file handle like things like FIFOs that we've talked about, uh, the socket is uh, usually set up for purpose of communicating with some other entity, and most frequently for communicating with out the outside world. So it'll oftentimes be tiled in ways uh, to data that keeps track of, of who it's talking to, uh, and some specific piece of hardware like a NIC or network interface card uh, that allows communication across that channel. Uh, you can have a whole bunch of sockets open at once so that a server could be handling multiple clients at, at once. Uh, and they represent an abstraction that's uh, an end-to-end -end communication that as one party writes into it, that will be automatically uh, translated by the operating system to whatever low-level communication is needed uh, to send the message to a second party. And this may go involve your computer talking to a wireless router or a wired router uh, and sending electrical signals across that network uh, to arrive at the other uh, party. Sockets are two-way, so unlike files, uh, you'll have a single socket or sort of the appearance of a single socket, uh, and as you would write into it, this sends data to the other party, and as you would read from it, uh, you will get the data from another party. So this uh, makes it somewhat more palatable than, for instance, the two FIFO system uh, that we have discussed before, uh, where if I want to talk to somebody, I have a FIFO that I put stuff into and write into, uh, and I have a second FIFO for that other entity to talk back to me. Uh, from the, the other entity of uh, FIFO. Uh, so to that end, uh, sockets are a little bit easier to set up on that front. Uh, in fact, they have a whole bunch of sort of machinery built into them uh, that's specifically associated with server and client connections.
So the first thing we need to resolve then is this uh, issue of addresses. Uh, for simplicity, uh, we're gonna stick mainly to the notion of these IPv4 addresses. Uh, in part, this is just because what I'm a little bit more acquainted with. Networking is not one of my strong computer science suits, uh, so I'm gonna do what's easy for me in this case, since this isn't uh, a topic that is central to the OS drive that we're on right now. And so a lot of the examples that we'll see uh, will make use of a host name of of 127.0.0.1. Uh, this kind of a string then uh, could be instead google.com uh, or uh, umn.edu. You'll notice there isn't an HTTP or anything in front of these things. That is actually a preface as part of the uh, address to indicate what protocol you want to talk to someone under. Uh, and the address itself is the, the what indicates the more or less virtual or physical address of the th entity that you're trying to contact at a moment. This as a string then is something that there are operating system facilities designed to parse into more internal data. And so we'll spend a little bit of time on this get address info function. You can see as its first argument, you pass in this host name. Uh, to that end, the get address info is actually a network communication function in its own right. And that will have to parse this string into some internal data representing the address, but then talk to routers and other directory service uh, uh, entities that are on the network to figure out what is a path uh, from uh, where I am right now to whatever entity I'm trying to, to look up. Uh, home 127.0.0.1, which is the address of the current machine that you're running on, um, this computer, as it were. This is not hard to find and probably won't involve a lot of network communication. However, Google.com is something that if uh, this is the first time that the computer is logging in uh, to a particular network, it may take a little bit of time to resolve where is the host that's associated with this string. Now you can pass a couple different forms in of the addresses. You can see the numeric one here, uh, a sort of stringy version here. Uh, but if you had the IPv4 address in sort of a, a quartet of numbers, 127. Whatever, whatever, then uh, you could also punt that in for Google. Uh, and after getting an address, you can actually give some other information uh, or get get some of that corresponding information. Uh, we'll look at some utilities associated with that at a later point. The second argument to this get address info is the port. And generally communications are divided on port numbers that as a server, if you want to offer some service uh, to sort of public access, uh, then this is uh, it requires that the host computer, uh, the server that's running, uh, open up a communication channel at a specific numbered location. Uh, these ports are interesting uh, in that there's been a sort of long sort of series of ports. Uh, the most common ones that you might have heard about are, for instance, port 80 is the public web server. Uh, port 22 is the port that uh, SSH or secure shell servers uh, work over. Uh, and there are a few other sort of numbered ports uh, that are interesting to look at in terms of um, their, their uh, established protocols. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I might have actually a list of these in here. Let me pause just a second and see if I can find this. Ah, okay. Of course, I found this uh, just by Googling around. Uh, one of the best lists is in the uh, Wikipedia article on this. Uh, and as you list down here, there are a bunch of port numbers that are listed over here, along with the standard um, uh, protocol and type of program that usually makes use of this. Uh, so I mentioned a moment ago uh, the SSH protocol, uh, SSH here. Uh, this is port 22. So if you wrote your own implementation of an SSH server, which is a program that would run on a machine and allow someone to SSH into that machine and get a shell there, uh, then during its operation, that server would have to open up port 22, uh, which is then established as uh, folks wanting to talk to it, uh, would find the address uh, on port 22 to talk to it uh, via this SSH. SSH uh, kind of protocol. Uh, you can imagine uh, this would involve a fair amount of encryption because the reason it's called Secure Shell is that it's a secure version of Telnet, which is an unencrypted version uh, that will send passwords and other data over uh, in the clear, uh, typically not used anymore because everyone's much more uh, uh, cognizant of security issues of things uh, flying over the network there. 
Uh, then if you scroll down a little ways, uh, you'll see port 80. This one's marked uh, in a different color because it's especially important. The hypertext protocol, uh, transfer protocol. So when you would be in a browser saying HTTP something, then this would default the browser to trying port 80 initially. Uh, there's a counterpart to this. Uh, and let me see if I can just... Uh, find it here, HTTPS, yeah, uh, port 443, uh, which is the secure version of um, uh, HTTP. Uh, so since uh, this is uh, farther down the line, it gives you sort of an indication that um, this is a newer innovation. And a lot of uh, the communication that's done these days in uh, web land is done actually securely. And so you can't even ask for a website uh, without doing, using some level of encryption. If you look uh, carefully at the address for uh, Wikipedia, it defaults to HTTPS as well. So uh, it's typical for a web browser to maybe try the HTTP first as you would punch an address, and as it uh, would see that uh, the preferred protocol is secure, uh, then it would switch over to using this second port, open up a different connection, uh, and communicate to using a different protocol that involves uh, encryption. Uh, so you see mentions of official down here. Uh, as you get to very high port numbers, um, it's the case that uh, not all of them are official. And so if you have a little uh, server over here, you look for some port that's relatively un uh, sort of unofficial. Uh, and if you get up into the 9000s and so forth, uh, then you'll see things in here that have don't have an official designation. So if you want to try out some program, you pick a large port number and, and you're good to go there. Uh, it won't conflict with any of the lower ones. But typically to open up a port on a serve on the server side you have to actually um, be able to uh, have a uh, root permission or administrator permission on this uh, I think my favorite port on uh, not that I've used it to any great extent uh, is uh, associated with doom uh, and this as an early first person online shooter uh, established a protocol to allow multiplayer stuff uh, to happen over the network and they picked ironically uh, port 666 uh, which for those who aren't familiar with uh, christianity is supposed to be the number of the devil uh, doom itself is uh, centered a lot on uh, sort of satanic entities coming from hell that you have to blast uh, with large large weapons now, we're getting a little bit off topic. Uh, so uh, this uh, get address info then will do perform a lookup service for you uh, to say uh, an address uh, and a port number. There are a bunch of uh, options that you can pass to this that dictate uh, performance, but like many system calls, you pass in the address of some struct uh, that is to be filled in by this and get a return value back uh, to indicate success or failure. Uh, and in the event of a failure, uh, you couldn't find some host or something like that, and you should probably spit on that and bail out because there's not much point in proceeding at this point uh, if you can't even find the host that you're looking for. On the other hand, if this returns success, uh, then this uh, struct will be filled in with data about that uh, server. The fields of this struct are you know, only semi-interesting. Uh, you'll see a bunch of uh, fields specifying things like uh, the type of socket that's going to be used, uh, and you have some control over this uh, as you would call get address info. Uh, the length of the address uh, that's present uh, in there, uh, and otherwise you can more or less use this thing as an opaque sort of data reference uh, to what was found on the network about the th entity that you're trying to contact. Uh, one interesting facet for those who are looking at this uh, carefully, so you notice the very last field down here has an interesting structure. Um, this is called a struct uh, address info, and the last field is a pointer to a struct address info, uh, giving you the impression that this isn't actually a, a singular entity, it actually might be a data structure, and always when you'd see pointer to something that's next, you should be thinking along the lines of a linked list of some kind. Uh, and it maybe isn't quite the style of linked list uh, that you'd be accustomed to, uh, but this very much is indicative of the fact that as you get addresses uh, using this get address info, you may actually have several different options uh, and can rifle through them, finding one that works for you, you best. Uh, this might be one instance in which, uh, as you would look up, for instance, human.edu, there might be a plain text HTTP version, there might be a secure HTTPS version, uh, and you can select from among them. 
Uh, this is generally done then by rifling through the linked list that's returned through this structure. And notice up here, essentially this is giving you node one of that in this serve info, uh, this address info up here uh, that is uh, associated with it. Uh, we'll largely just presume that if this succeeds that the first address in here is gonna be one that works for us. Uh, but generally that's an unsafe assumption. Uh, and if you're writing robust network code, which is always harder, then you may have to write some iteration code to try out several different addresses to see uh, one is IPv4, one is IPv6, and so forth. So as you would rifle through the addresses, for instance, chase this pointer to the next one, then you could examine the statistics associated with that uh, connection uh, or that address uh, resolution and see which one is preferable according to your application logic. So uh, with an uh, address in hand, uh, then we filled this in via uh, the uh, get address info. The next major call to make on a client side to open up a socket connection to some other uh, uh, computer uh, is as follows. Uh, the socket system call is going to create one of these. Uh, we'll see it returns an integer and talk about that in a second. But you pass in several fields that come out of this uh, serve info family. Uh, importantly, you need to know the family of protocol, uh, the socket type, uh, and the actual internet protocol that's going to be uh, used there. Uh, this can be one of several things, but typically as you would look something up, uh, it would specify you can talk to me via uh, IP, uh, what is it, uh, uh, TCP IP or, or something like that. Uh, and so you can pass these fields of the serve info through uh, without too much modification. Uh, what's returned then uh, is a, a data structure of some kind, uh, but uh, it isn't the case yet that this is directly usable. Uh, instead, this is something then that the operating system has in the background uh, as a sort of setup connection. Uh, and you'll need a second call then based on that socket file descriptor uh, to actually form the connection wholeheartedly. Uh, and this connect then is again something that can succeed or fail, uh, but uh, the return uh, that's given here is what we're actually going to make use of uh, eventually. Uh, or sorry, uh, this return over here is not something we're going to make use of eventually. Uh, so this is essentially established connection and then turn it on via this kind of connect business. Uh, with all that in, in play then, uh, you're finally in a position to actually talk to an, another entity. Uh, and so if all goes well uh, and you have this socket file descriptor and the connect succeeds on it, uh, then you can make calls like read and write uh, to this socket file descriptor. And this sounds a little bit like, well, huh. I mean, this is just a, a read now uh, and a write, uh, and truly it is that this sock FD, uh, so named as a variable up here, but to emphasize that it's like a file descriptor at this point, except that when you read from it, you'll wait, from wait for communication uh, across the network, and when you write to it, it will send a connection to or that data across the network to this other thing. Uh, this is actually a brilliant innovation on the part of the Unix uh, developers because it means all of your favorite friends are applicable here, and anything that you wrote to work locally that uses read and writes can be readily adapted by just plopping down here instead of a standard file or FIFO file descriptor, a socket file descriptor, and most of this stuff will work on that front. There is an alternative uh, that there's a receive call that is specially tied to socket file descriptors. So this system call doesn't work with your standard files and FIFOs and so forth. Uh, it has, in addition to the standard arguments you'd expect from a read or a type uh, call with the file descriptor, where to put data and how much to read, it has some additional options that you can pass in. Uh, and this could be things like timeouts uh, or um, Actually, I, I don't remember anymore, and we won't emphasize on this uh, uh, very, very much, uh, other than that it's a slightly fancier version of a read on that front. Uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, it's sufficient to make use of your standard sort of I.O. facilities. Uh, keeping uh, the uh, number of system calls that's required relatively small is a, a wise decision in most kernel development. Oops, sorry, I'm moving ahead. Uh, let's examine how all of this plays out uh, together in a simple server.c. 
uh, sorry, a simple client.c. Uh, we're going to run a little server in the background that will be the point of discussion later on. Uh, but uh, for the moment, we're just going to examine the client code in this simple client.c and see that when you fire up the server and then when you fire up this client, all that the server does is on a client connecting, uh, the server will send some data to the client that says hello world. Uh, that alone, that small task is uh, takes uh, quite a bit of setup as we've seen and so is worth just sort of uh, expounding on just a little bit. Uh, okay, so let's see, we have a simple client here, uh, and we'll go through the code of that in just a second. So let me arrange things over here so that I have a t couple terminals. Uh, now let's flip this over here, over in here. Uh, so in this bottom terminal, I'm going to GCC the simple server. Uh, and this will be simple server.c. Okay, uh, and then up top here, I'm going to change server to client. We'll GCC that. Uh, and so down here, I'll run the server, simple server. And you can see it is uh, waiting and uh, set up on address uh, 0000. Uh, importantly, this is the home address. And so as I run the simple client, I need to actually feed it an address as a command line. Uh, and it's opening uh, port 1, uh, 12,344. This is a high number port, so it's likely to be assigned to anything on my uh, piddly laptop uh, computer at the moment. Uh, but uh, so it's probably safe to use. If I had requested, for instance, uh, port 22, which is associated with the SSH connections, then I'd probably get uh, return addresses of, I, I can't actually bind that socket, but we'll, we'll I'll, I'll talk about that later when we, uh, in uh, the sort of next session when we get into the server code part of this. Um, so over yonder on the left hand side, and I'll pull up line numbers, uh, let's walk through what this client code is going to do. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you need a command line argument over here. And so as I call this thing, I have to give a host name. Uh, as I would do, do simple clients up here, you get uh, the need for a host name. Uh, and if I passed in one something like 127.0.0.1, uh, then you'll see the central behavior of this, uh, which it connects uh, to 127.0.0.1, uh, sees that there's a server listening there, uh, and then receives from the server a hello world, which ends the program. You can see the server notice this. It's like, oh, uh, there was a connection uh, from this address, the home address, uh, and uh, this was uh, something that it saw and responded to, and I could you know, rerun this thing again, uh, and you get a second connection over here. Uh, you'll notice over here is something interesting that we'll need to talk about later, uh, that despite my request to connect, uh, connect on port uh, 12344, uh, that's mentioned up here as a pound to find, both in the client and the server, they have to agree on what port is, is going to be used. Um, this is reported as a, a connection associated with a different port, uh, 14,384. Uh, we'll need to discuss that a little bit more uh, later on, uh, and it's associated with uh, the socket semantics where as a server connects to a client, it actually spins up a, a separate socket uh, that will, it will do business with the client on. Uh, and this is to enable other folks to come in on the public socket or the public port here on 12344. Uh, so that's occupied only for incoming traffic and reflects very much a pattern that we have begun to get acquainted with uh, in terms of server client dynamics. All right, but back to the client code. Uh, so having taken this address from the first argument uh, of the command line, uh, we make use of that uh, get address info call over here. So this is the lookup part that translates this string uh, into the string host name here uh, into something that can be used to look up the, the actual server. This may for network communications involve uh, a sort of communication over, over the network. Uh, I could, for instance, try this simple server with something else like uh, google.com. Uh, and this will probably hang at this point because uh, my client, which has a, a very simple sort of uh, uh, um, structure to it, is waiting on Google to like say something back to it. Uh, we'll look at a, another version of this code in the homework uh, that actually makes use of the HTTP protocol uh, and its ILK HTTPS uh, to talk to Google and get information back from it. Uh, but this simple client isn't designed to do that right now because uh, it's not talking to Google.com in a protocol that Google likes. Uh, instead, you'd want to talk and say certain things like uh, HTTP requests and so forth. Uh, so look forward to seeing uh, how this will work out for now. Right now, about the only thing the simple client can talk 
talk to effectively is this uh, simple server instead. So down here, uh, then after checking to make sure that address lookup worked out okay, uh, down here is where uh, we'll actually create the sockets. And you'll see several of the fields that are uh, filled in by this get address info are passed in, uh, uh, assert that that is okay, and then form a connection using the socket. Uh, if these things are successful, then uh, we can establish a little bit of information about what the address looks like in a stringy form using this little get address string uh, utility function. Uh, that's farther down here. It's uh, really ugly and obtuse and took me a long time to figure out how to write uh, after looking at a lot of examples. Um, so uh, on that front, uh, don't worry about that much too much. Uh, all that does is to spit out this uh, part of the uh, uh, info array over here, uh, which is after the connection is formed, uh, to show exactly what the sort of address looks like in a, a stringy form. And there are no surprises here uh, that it's a uh, home computer. The only thing that's kind of weird is that it's a different socket. Um, but there's a different so a port or socket than what is uh, 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 established first and we'll talk next time about the distinction between a socket and a port uh, okay so uh, after sort of printing that info out there's no reason to hold on to that address within the program so you can issue a free to uh, get rid of that uh, data this frees up potentially some kernel data structures that's maintaining about that stuff but the all-important actual communication happens here and it doesn't look again like anything special it's read from the socket file descriptor uh, and after reading null terminate the string that was received and plop this thing down uh, on the screen the alternative to that uh, would be to call instead of read up here uh, this receive and uh, the default options in this case zero but it would, would, would do us just fine. So this is the basics of what a uh, client would look like. Uh, and generally clients are simpler because they are singular. Uh, they only want to talk to one server at a time uh, typically, uh, and they don't have to worry about managing multiple entities. Uh, they're the only sort of boss in town. Things come uh, become a little bit more complicated when you look at the server side of stuff, uh, which will occupy us in our next session together. Uh, but we have a few uh, sort of wrap up notes on, on that front. Um, so there are a series of network specific communication functions of uh, receive and send that are largely equivalents of read and write, uh, except that there are a few sort of options that are worth knowing about uh, associated with them. Um, importantly, with these socket file descriptors, all of your standard I.O. functions, uh, read, write, select, poll, etc., these work uh, just fine together. Uh, and the network communication generally has an identical interface uh, to other files, although you should be ever cognizant that when you are writing or reading from these things, uh, they are a stream-like entity. Uh, so unlike files, uh, these socket connections, uh, they, you cannot sort of backtrack in them in an appreciable way. Uh, so if you read some stuff uh, and you read again, it'll be the next stuff, very much like a pipe or a FIFO in that respect. But you're already getting used to that, uh, having worked with that kind of data before. Now, one of the options that you can pass to receive is actually to peek at an incoming message. Uh, and this is a slightly sort of more sophisticated facility associated with uh, sockets than what you'd get with FIFOs. This allows you to have a look at the data that's in the next message, uh, but uh, without actually uh, uh, sort of extracting it from the stream. So you can look ahead a little bit to see if which, uh, what's there is of interest to you. Generally, uh, the, you'll see that the semantics here for um, both read and receive and so forth, they're uh, identical to semantics we use for read uh, uh, since the beginning, that you have to request some amount of data, uh, a maximum data size, and provide a buffer that's associated with that. Um, so this is a little bit different than, for instance, what we talked about in terms of message queues, where there's an automatic division of uh, messages there. Sockets are basically a byte stream uh, with this added facility that if you make use of receive, you can look at some amount of data ahead uh, without actually extracting from it. Uh, you can also then pass to send uh, this message don't wait option. Uh, and this is useful because a standard write you think of in operating system lamb is completing fairly fast that it's instructions to the operating system uh, to plop something down in a file. Uh, if it's a huge amount of data, maybe it'll take a while. But network communications tend to be laggy. And so your process is going to block until these read or receive or write or send operations complete. 
if it's important that your program send this message off and move on to the next thing, uh, then essentially using send with this message don't wait uh, is a non-blocking option that it will signal the operating system, here's the data to move out there, copy it into your buffers and get me going next to the next bit of code is, uh, that I can do as fast as possible. Uh, and generally then, if you use a standard write, what you'll probably get depending on protocol is uh, that there will be a send of that message to whoever is on the opposite side of the connection and an acknowledgement of receipt. Uh, this is a typical TCP IP uh, protocol, if I remember right, that uh, senders will send something and then receivers will acknowledge that so senders know that they um, have received it. And if uh, senders are sending and finding the receiver isn't receiving, then they may resend. Uh, and so this can create delays in a network. Uh, this bypasses that, as in just don't wait for it. So uh, I think that's uh, largely where we should leave off at this point, uh, but it's important that one would uh, start to think about the server side of this, which will occupy our last lecture on the topic. Uh, and we've discussed uh, the client side of this in some detail. The server side is gonna have a few more tricks to it, uh, but importantly, one of the things that it needs to surmount is that multiple clients are typically trying to contact a server on the same address. Uh, so you can imagine Google.com, which serves a lot of clients. Uh, it has, for instance, an open port 80, uh, which is the address that you typically talk on an unencrypted uh, HTTP connection. Uh, this presents an interesting issue where a whole lot of clients are trying to hit Google at the same time by talking through this one communication channel, this port that is open on the server associated with Google. We have seen this kind of problem before, uh, and it's a problem of concurrency and coordination. Uh, that you have this poor singular Google server, although singular maybe isn't uh, truly the case, uh, but we'll think of it as a singular server uh, that has to answer hundreds of thousands of client requests per second even. Uh, and this can make coordination of who's asking for what and how Google keeps track of all these clients somewhat difficult. Ponder this, a uh, little tantalizing uh, nugget. Uh, how might you solve this problem? Uh, if you think hard, you may have actually seen a system design already associated with this. Uh, that makes it much easier and much more palatable uh, to allow a single server to easily keep track of a whole lot of clients uh, and importantly, communicate with them in a sort of unique way. That's all I've got for the moment. I will see you guys hopefully in lecture. Uh, and until we cross paths again, hope everyone's healthy and happy hacking.